Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone, wherever you are. Welcome to our session today on strengthening nature's ability to deliver effective climate action in Africa. We have an exciting lineup of speakers today and uh, we look forward to hearing from them. So as we all know, Africa is on the front lines of climate change and nature loss. In, in nature loss. Climate change is impacting our communities across the continent. Right now, Madagascar is on the brink of the world's first climate change famine. And the recent IPCC report has made it clear that things are only going to get worse. Indeed, climate change could wipe out 15% of Africa's gross domestic product by 2030. And the Global Center on Adaptation report that we'll hear about today concluded that climate change will push up to 43 million people in Sub-Saharan Africa into extreme poverty by 2030 if nothing is done to mitigate its effects. So undoubtedly, we must increase our mitigation effort to reach net zero by 2050. But simultaneously, we must also work together to drastically scale up efforts to build resilience in Africa to help the continent's most vulnerable people and many vital ecosystems to adapt. Now, this session is timely today uh, to, as uh, world leaders and other key stakeholders are gathered in Glasgow uh, to share strategic reflections on the gaps, to unlock the and priorities to secure and build impactful nature solutions in Africa. We also see this event as a great opportunity to inform the upcoming Africa Protected Areas Congress, which will take place in Rwanda in March 2022, where we, WWF, are leading a session on protected areas and climate change and really looking to highlight how the, how the vulnerability assessment of protected areas and the need to secure a better future for nature and people in Africa. So today I would like, I mean, I am, I welcome five key speakers. Uh, I will introduce them now. Um, Kevin Coldry. Kevin joins us from the South African Environmental Policy Research Unit. He has experience in socioeconomic and ecosystem service modeling, vulnerability assessment, and econometric and spatial analysis, which he uses to assist governments and NGOs with developing appropriate adaptation and mitigation responses. Kevin also applies himself to modeling cost benefit analysis and financial modeling for nature-based solutions. Our second speaker will be Anthony Nyong. Professor Anthony Nyong is the Regional Director Africa at the Global Center on Adaptation. He is seconded from the African Development Bank, where he was seconded from the Director of Climate Change and Green Growth. Professor Nyong has about 30 years of experience in environmental and natural resource management, environment and social safeguards, renewable energy and green growth that span academia, private sector and development finance. A third speaker will be Candace Stevens. Candace joins us from the Wilderness Foundation Africa. She is a green finance innovator and biodiversity expert, a niche tax specialist who develops innovative finance solutions for sustainable landscapes. She is head of innovative finance and policy at the Wilderness Foundation and chair of the Sustainable Landscape Finance Coalition, where she works extensively with multiple stakeholders and industry leaders. The fourth speaker will be Matteo Bigoni. Matteo joins us from FSD Africa. He is the Senior Climate Finance Special Specialist with the Capital Markets Team. FSD Africa is a development agency wholly supported by the UK aid with a mandate to strengthen capital markets in Africa. And finally, we'll have Harry Sower, who join us, joins us from WWF as the Africa Climate Change Adaptation Coordinator. She is a highly motivated environmental scientist, scientist with over 10 years working on climate change adaptation issues. So those are our speakers, and I'll start with you, Kevin. Kevin, and I'll invite you to set the scene in sharing the vulnerability assessment of protected and conserved areas to climate change in Africa that you, you'd you worked on, uh, commissioned by WWF, and highlighting also the key recommendations. Kevin, you have five minutes. Thank you very much, Alison. Good day, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, Yes, so together with uh, Wendy Foden and Jane Turpey, we have developed a framework for assessing the vulnerability of protected areas to climate change, uh, which has been provisionally accepted for publishing by the Conservation Biology Journal. The framework draws on the IPCC's definition of vulnerability, which is a function of a system's sensitivity to climate threats and the capacity of the system to adapt to these threats. 
The framework is useful at both the protected area level as well as at the network level. At the protected area level, it allows for the key vulnerabilities for each protected area to uh, assess to be identified. And at the network level, it allows for the most vulnerable protected areas to be identified, which assists with resource allocation. The framework considers a, prote a protected area's potential climate impacts to be a function of species change, habitat change, and resource pressure change as a result of a change in climate. While a protected area's capacity to adapt is seen as a function of a protected area's management effectiveness, adjacent land use, and financial resilience. Financial resilience is in turn a function of a protected area's tourism resilience and infrastructure resilience, which are, which are both subject to changes in climate through the impact of extreme weather events such as flooding and storm surges with respect to infrastructure and changes in key attractions tourist comfort levels, disease risk, and viewing experience with respect to tourism. Next slide, please. To date, the framework has been applied to over 1,500 protected areas globally. For WWF, it has been applied to 263 protected and conserved areas across Sub-Saharan Africa specifically within the Tridom landscape in West Africa, the Kaza landscape in Southern Africa, the Soknot landscape in Eastern Africa, and the Greater Virunga landscape in Central Africa. It was also applied to communal conservancies in Namibia and protected areas within Madagascar. Next slide, please. The potential climate impacts, uh, which is the mean of the species change, habitat change, and resource pressure change scores, were high for most protected and conserved areas assessed, with the highest scores being registered for protected areas in Kenya and Tanzania. Interestingly and alarmingly, for seven of the protected areas assessed, more than 50% of the animal and plant species considered are expected to no longer find the, P, uh, the protected area climatically suitable by 2050. And furthermore, a further 10 protected areas assessed for more than 10 protected areas assessed, more than 50% of the protected and conserved biomes are expected to be altered by 2050. These insights are based on spe species distribution models and a dynamic vegetation model specifically developed for Africa under the SPARC project. Next slide, please. The capacity of protected areas to adapt to climate change, which is the mean of the management effectiveness, adjacent land use and financial resilience scores, were high for most protected and conserved areas, with the lowest scores being registered for protected and conserved areas in Namibia, the DRC and Rwanda. Next slide, please. The overall vulnerability scores were higher, with only 1.5% of the protected areas um, assessed to be resilient uh, to climate change, while 57% were considered to be highly vulnerable to climate change. From a country perspective, protected areas within Kenya had the highest mean vulnerability scores, followed by Namibia, while protected areas within Gabon and the Congo had the lowest mean vulnerability Gabon. scores. Congo. Next slide, please. In terms of recommendations, we opted to err on the side of caution and speak more to building resilience than applying specific adaptation responses. This limits the potential for maladaptation and provides species and ecosystems the best opportunity to adapt to climate change in their own way. The overarching recommendations include protecting and re rehabilitating areas identified as important refuges for species, Restoring, creating, and facilitating wildlife dispersal areas and movement corridors. Developing dynamic transboundary strategies and plans to ensure joint management of climate impacts on biodiversity and people. Strengthening local and transboundary monitoring of climate, species, and ecosystem interactions. And assisting communities with diversifying into climate compatible livelihoods, as well as climate proofing their existing livelihoods. Thank you very much.
I think, Kevin, that Alice lost her connection. I am not sure. Yeah, Alice is gone. So do we have the agenda in hands? I don't know. I am going to moderate in some way. But thank you, Kevin. But I don't have the agenda in hand. Ah, she's back. She's back. Yeah, she's back. Thank you. Sorry, my uh, I lost uh, power here, and uh, so my connection failed me. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry that <laughs> you finished when I didn't hear you. Um, can I can I invite Tony? Is Tony in? Not yet, but we can move on with uh, with the next speaker, Alice. We can move to, to Candice. Okay, Candice, are you here? Great. Thank you so much, Alice, and thank you to Kevin for setting the scene so well. Um, Africa really is a, a land of opportunity and of risk at the same time. And as we address both the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis, there is a critical mechanism that comes into play to make our goals a reality. If we're going to address nature effectively in its protection, in its resilience, adaptation, mitigation, and a wealth of other interventions, we require sustainable finance in order to do that. So what's happened um, across the continent of Africa is the, the rising call for a need for both sustainable finance and resilient sources of income so that we can address the challenges both for people and for the planet. But this is no easy task. We can talk about finance, but actually developing innovative finance solutions is another thing entirely, which is why WWF together with Wilderness Foundation Africa have launched Africa's Sustainable Landscape Finance Coalition, which really seeks to bring a cross-sectoral collaborative approach to developing landscape finance. In other words, bringing cross-disciplinary skill sets together from private, public, and civil society experts to address these finance gaps so that we're able to effectively, adequately, and into the long term, finance our climate actions and our biodiversity actions. And what's so exciting about protected and conserved areas is that we're able to address those finance challenges at a landscape level and have interventions that speak to both crises and have benefits for people and planet at the same time. But in order to do that, there are two critical points that I'd like to put across when we speak about financing these goals. The first is that when we look at nature in its perfect state, if it's at all possible, there's very little finance actually required to be able to keep it like that. Um, restoration, although vitally important, the same with rehabilitation, are more costly than simply protecting what we have. And so it's a critical point from a finance and resource mobilization point of view to address the concerns we have around restoring things that have become degraded or lost as a result of our decisions. Whereas if we're protecting what we already have, for example, in Africa's protected areas, the costs are drastically lower from an economic point of view. Finance is still required and finance from different sources. We've seen through the COVID-19 pandemic, the impact on protected areas across Africa and therefore their inability to address livelihoods as well as climate and biodiversity actions simply because of the over-reliance on one single source of income or one single source of funding. And so we need to diversify those streams and that requires us to develop and innovate new financial solutions and to move away from our traditional understanding of financing these areas. The Sustainable Landscape Finance Coalition has developed a four-stage finance solution approach to doing that in taking new concepts from incubation into piloting, strategically implementing them across a key landscape so that the solution is tailor-made with the right building blocks in place and ultimately moving to scale faster. An example of one of these has been South Africa's biodiversity tax incentives, which were designed to provide an extraordinary tax deduction to South African taxpayers who declared protected areas. To date, we're looking at 83 million US dollars that have come into South Africa's protected areas of new finance, finance outside of the ordinary source of finance that we generally see for protected areas. And these solutions are being replicated and transferred to other regions, which is extremely exciting. And then beyond that, we're currently diversifying the range of tools that are available for us. 
And so what I'd like to end with today is the, the critical point around sustainable financing. In the same way that we need to innovate around how we address climate and biodiversity, particularly at a landscape level, we also need to innovate in our approaches to how we sustainably finance these interventions so that they're able to be done at the scale and into the long term that we need to really see our targets achieved. Thanks very much, Alice. Thank you very much, Candace. I picked, you know, very important points there. Protecting is much cheaper than uh, restoring, as you say. And you also really highlighted the fact that over-reliance on tourism resources uh, has, has now, that model has been questioned by COVID-19. And really lastly, emphasizing the need to innovate around the way that we finance. Okay, so the next one, uh, our next speaker, Matteo, will talk to us a little bit about finance. And uh, will talk to us about capital markets. We get to hear about capital markets. Matteo, uh, come in. What are capital markets? What is the current role of capital markets in supporting nature-based solutions for adaptation in Africa? Thank you, Alice. Um, and thank you, everybody else. Um, to set the scene around what capital markets are, I guess that four or five minutes is, will not be enough to describe capital markets in detail. But essentially, capital markets is, is a marketplace where there's interaction of um, uh, debt buyers and debt issues. And the debt buyers are typically investors that provide long-term capital to debt issues, such as companies or banks. And so uh, capital markets provide the opportunity for capital allocation at the long term. Um, and typically, is financial institutions and um, uh, long-term capital providers such as pension funds provide the long-term capital um, at a scale. So capital markets actually manage to provide um, a, a mass opportunity for capital allocation globally. Um, and the generally, uh, this is subdivided into international um, capital providers such as uh, large international institutions and pension funds and domestic uh, capital markets um, uh, investors, such as domestic pension funds. And so capital markets can basically provide the key to unlocking long-term um, capital for uh, adaptation and resilience. And if you look at what capital markets have done historically, um, they're mostly focused on mitigation. So uh, energy, uh, clean energy or transport. And adaptation and resilience, and especially nature-based solutions, have been overall uh, massively underinvested. Um, but this is about to change. And that's because there has been a lot of efforts to uh, come up with innovating financing solutions, as Candice was saying, or rather, Candice was mentioning. Um, typically, uh, they, there have been uh, a dichotomy between capital markets and what we call uh, carbon finance. And a lot of uh, funds and a lot of issues are actually seeking to combine the two um, so as to basically allow carbon credits to become effectively a collateral for um, the financing repayments of debts, sustainable repayments of debts. In other words, uh, you protect the forest or you regenerate the forest uh, or coastal mangrove protections or um, uh, grasslands even, um, soil carbon, etc. You generate a carbon credit. That carbon credit has a monetary value that can be used in order to basically repay for debt that is issued um, in order to expand the carbon project at scale at the landscape project, at the landscape level. So in other words, capital markets can provide both the scale and amount necessary to really increase um, uh, nature-based solutions and protected areas in Africa in places where, uh, you know, sometimes even uh, there's fragile political institutions that cannot really support uh, direct investment into natural capital. Also, um, in, in capital, capital markets can provide long-term solutions. So it's not just about providing immediate returns, but really providing long-term secured returns. And there are lots of mechanisms that have really come up quite recently, such as guarantees um, that can really provide, or funds that can really provide support for uh, areas such as um, uh, agriculture, uh, regenerative agriculture, that typically um, uh, require an, an, an initial upfront cost uh, before generating activities later on. 
In other words, if you plant uh, agroforest operations now, if you start agroforest operations now, there will be a gap between the generation of activities, uh, the generation of carbon credits, and re the repayment schedule. So capital markets and debt can actually provide the capital to support the initial upfront cost in order to then uh, implement um, the uh, nature-based solutions later on, establish it, and, and make it uh, able to thrive. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Matteo. I definitely, I definitely heard about the unlocking of the long-term financing and the role that capital markets play there. And of course, you give, you give examples of carbon finance and others, but you also talked about guarantees and the way that they can actually guarantee by paying those upfront costs, which is very interesting. I'm sure there will be questions later about how what we need to do to scale those up. But uh, let me move to our next speaker. Um, I'm assuming Anthony is not here yet, so I will go to you, Harisawa, uh, to share a little bit more, as we said earlier, yeah that uh, this uh, this um, session is also going to inform an upcoming session we're going to have at the Africa Protected Areas Congress in Kigali. So Harisoa will share some of what we are doing there and why this is important for us, for this session is important for that for that one. Over to you, Harisoa. Thanks so much, Alice. And uh, as I mentioned by Alice, uh, I'm going based on all of the great discussion that you have on finance and research, and uh, this COP26 is really uh, on time really to, to see how we can really put in place the right, right strategies to boost the role of nature to, to people as well. And uh, as said, we will have this Africa Protected Area Congress happening in uh, Kigali in Rwanda uh, next year. And uh, part of that is really to deliver climate change uh, agenda. And the uh, COP is really key as, uh, as, you, as we know, one of the goal of the COP26 is really to how we can help, help adapt uh, nature and people with regards to climate change. And given that the role that protected areas are playing for Africa. So it really, all of the discussion that we have today is really key uh, to help us really frame in what climate agenda we need to push forward in Africa for the next coming years and really to secure the resilience of these protected areas and, and particularly as well to, to push forward the, the potential as not the best solution for Africa. So the Congress will be an opportunity really to consolidate what's going on in Africa and Kevin already shared about that, that the, our protected areas are, are already vulnerable, vulnerable to climate change and we need really to act. And it's an opportunity as well for us to share best practices, how we can really secure the, the potential of these protected areas and conserved areas that will help to secure as well the, the benefits that people are relying rely on. And uh, one uh, next slide, one thing that we want to really do highlight is how we can, how we can really set up a Pan-African strategy on climate change and the protected areas to really guide us to drive transformational knowledge, solution, policy, and sustainable finance in Africa. I think that we have we have heard a lot from Candice and from, from Matteo on how we can put in place a solution as well as to, to invest as well on the capital market that protected areas are, are providing. And how we can really establish a Pan-African think tank on climate change and conservation. And uh, as I said, these are still suggested action and this really need like a, our coalition, coalition of government of civil society organization, international organization community to really put in place this strategy and put in place this Pan-African think tank. And the idea as well is really uh, that government will commit to provide the more inclusive and fundamental role of protected areas and conserved areas as not the best solution for climate change. And that this is something growing and gaining attention, but how we can really measure that? How we can really make that effective? And uh, the idea is it should be really part of the post 2020 framework that are still in the discussion, as well as a part of the implementation of, of, of Africa national determined contribution, how nature could be up of front, how nature could really contribute to increase the resilience of people and biodiversity. And the last thing is, uh, I don't know if you have heard about this uh, uh, Red Parks Congress declaration, 
which put protected areas as part of the solution, both in terms of mitigation and adaptation. And that how Africa could join this alliance as well to drive a more global declaration. So I said, these are still ongoing. And apart from the Africa Protected Area Congress is still under preparation. And uh, I, am, I am saying here that really uh, uh, saying that, uh, that it needs really our joint commitment we need to deliver the, 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 the strategic climate change commitment that will help us really to secure our protected areas and conserved area in Africa and also people. So thanks so much and over to you, Alice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harris Sawara. Uh, we've definitely noted the, uh, obviously starting with Kevin's presentation where he clearly showed the vulnerability of protected areas to climate change which also leads very well into the fact that we need a pan-African strategy on climate change and protected areas, and that we need a pan-African think tank, but also the Red Pax Declaration. And of course, the previous speaker has talked about finance because finance is a key component of this. So I now have the pleasure, before we move into the Q&A, to invite uh, uh, Professor Anthony Nyong to talk to us about the global climate change, global, global, um, adaptation report, uh, Global Center on Adaptation uh, report. Um, Anthony, what is the Global Center on Adaptation driving in Africa on nature and climate and how, and tell us a little bit more about how the state and trends on adaptation report in Africa, what the findings are and what commitments Africa should make to secure transformative solutions and adaptation benefits driven by nature-based solutions. Over to yeah, you. Thank, yeah, thank you so very much for the kind invitation to be able to speak with you today. Um, nature is very important to us. And I think we've missed it all the while because some people believe that technologies can replace nature. And we're gradually and consistently seeing that that is not the case. Um, it's so vital to both mitigation and adaptation, you know, incorporating nature-based solutions and all that. So what we have done is at the Global Center on Adaptation, we have decided to scale up adaptation. It's not receiving as much attention as mitigation is receiving globally. When you look at the expenditures, typically it's about 90% of all climate resources have gone for mitigation just about 10% only goes to adaptation. And we think this is not right. And for Africa, this is also very appalling that uh, only 19% of the resources flowing into Africa goes to adaptation, and which is very little. If you consider that 3% of, if you consider that 3% of the total finance goes to Africa only that. So what we've done at the Global Center on Adaptation is to scale up, to design with the African Development Bank, a program we've tagged the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program, because we want to scale up, we want to accelerate adaptation on the African continent. And we've done very serious assessments uh, of the NDCs, assessments of national adaptation plans, assessments of the regional strategy, the AU strategies, and all other national strategies. And we identified four key niche areas. We identified four bold ideas that if we could do them, then we would be able to transform and really accelerate adaptation on the African continent. The first is on agriculture, not just anything about agriculture, but the gap is in digital advisory services and digital technologies, climate advisory services and digital technologies. Most of us are still farming the way my grandmother farmed. If it rains, we eat. If it doesn't rain, we starve. And we're saying that is not the way to go. We need to get digital technologies and solutions to our smallholder farmers. And so that's our first priority. The second priority is that about 70% of Africa's agriculture is, uh, infrastructure is yet to be built. And we are taking advantage of our underdevelopment 
to ensure that we'll build right in the first instance. And we're focusing on nature-based solutions. You know, so there's a lot that we are doing on nature-based solutions. We've developed a framework for investment in nature-based solutions, which has always been a barrier. People talk about it, but who actually knows what the dividends are? We've actually looked at uh, the other dividends on in resilient investments. And we've seen that there is at least a four, that there is at least positive cost benefit ratios when it comes to investment in resilience. Then we have developed PPP programs, master classes. We also, we are doing a certification program on what we call the climate resilient infrastructure officers. Thirdly, we're working on our youth. Africa's median age, 19.7 years. These are all children. That's our median age. And this could be a blessing or it could be a disaster. And we don't want it to be a liability or a disaster. We turn these youth into assets. So we have two things we're doing there. I'll come to Nature Best Solutions again. Two things we're doing there. One is that we ensure that every project that is going to go off the mill on Africa must have a component for job creation, must. So we developed that framework and we're working across the continent. And then secondly, not everyone wants to be employed. Some are entrepreneurs. So we have launched a competition that on the 5th of this month in two days time, we're going to announce our first winners of up to $100,000 each to take them from where there are now a small or micro, medium, small scale enterprises across the value of death into where they can become commercially viable. So that comes with a 12 month incubation, six months of acceleration and handholding to take them to where it ought to be. And the final thing we looked at is on finance. It's important to us everything we talk about, whether it's in biodiversity, nature-based solutions, infrastructure, money is the glue that holds it. So we've developed innovative financing solutions. And the one that will be of interest is the resilience bonds. You know, we're working on that a lot. We are work, talking to two countries now on resilience bonds. Then we are also working on things uh, uh, like debt for climate swap, you know, to convert some of Africa's debts into climate investment from those countries. So uh, having said that, we believe that in all these things I've said, whether it's in infrastructure, where we've seen the commercial value of uh, nature-based solutions, for instance, mangroves, green against great technologies and so on. So that brings me to the uh, state and trends in adaptation. We've looked at it. What is it? Where are we on adaptation on the continent? We've seen the adaptation gap report that UNEP has produced, very useful document. But we're telling ourselves, if we do not change our narratives, private sector won't come in. Private sector is not about doom and gloom. So the state and trends in adaptation report is, the, is a series that we are going to be presenting every year that tells us what the state is today, where are we heading to? But most importantly, the message there is that there are investment positives. There are opportunities in Africa to invest in resilience, to invest in nature-based solutions. WWF wrote a, a chapter on it, on nature-based solutions, and it's, it, it, it really shows that there are opportunities. We are a great fan of the WWF for what you are doing in protecting nature, but I can tell you that that state and trends report is not that Africa will sink and die, but that Africa has opportunities. Everyone come on, there's room for business in Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much. I like that message. You're right, no doom and gloom. No, there's room, yeah. there's opportunities as you've said. Uh, thank you so much. I think you talked about the Adaptation Accelerator Program. That's really good and welcome. Yeah. You talked about four bold ideas, agriculture, the digital climate advisory services and technology, the, nature, the framework for investments in nature-based solutions, and the dividends, of course, 
the climate resilient infrastructure leaders. I like that the youth, you know, that's good. And those innovate and entrepreneurs. And then finally, you talked about money being the remover and the bond, the resilience bonds and the debt for climate swaps. Thank you very much, Tony. Those are very, very exciting developments. And I, I agree with you that, uh, no, it's not doom and gloom. It's excellent opportunities here. So uh, those were our speakers. I have a couple of follow-up questions already coming in. So I will uh, start with you, Kevin. There is a question about, give me a minute to look at it in the chat. I hope I didn't lose it. Yes. Could you say a bit more about the methodology used in the analysis and whether it is possible for, to use it for community-led research, such as that done by the youth mapper groups in Tanzania? Great. Thanks. Thanks for the um, for the question. Um, so we've designed the framework with the intention that um, protected area managers can apply it to their protected areas. Um, it, it, it can be applied uh, using a range of data sets. So if, if there is no fine scale data, that it is possible to use uh, global data sets. Uh, and essentially, the aim of the the framework or uh, the vulnerability assessment is to is to highlight or identify where the key vulnerabilities are within a protected area, as well as to identify what are the um, or which are the most vulnerable protected areas within a um, uh, within a network of protected areas. I am also busy working with a team at Stellenbosch University here in South Africa to try and understand what is driving. Um, the vulnerability of these protected areas, protected and conserved areas. So we've now got a, you know, a, um, a database of, of um, over 1,500 um, protected and conserved areas that that the framework has been applied to, um, and and now we want to sort of look at what it, what what are some of the attributes of those areas um, that could be. Uh, uh, you know, sort of um, determining the the level of vulnerability, and we already think things like uh, the size of a protected area is important, um, uh, and would uh, you know uh, result in higher vulnerability the smaller the protected area is. Um, in terms of the application um, to uh, um, to the to the community uh, led um, programs that you're talking about, I think. With any vulnerability assessment, it's important to to fine tune it to to make it relevant to the the system that you are trying to determine the vulnerability of. Um, the The framework that we've uh, developed is is very much focused on a a um, protected and conserved areas, um, but. Yeah, this, there's obviously a lot of scope to to create um, and to to fine tune these uh, kind of methodologies to accommodate other types um, uh, of, of areas and systems. Thanks. Thank you so much. So our youth mappers will definitely come to you, reach out to you and see how some of their data can be used in, in your in the methodology. Um, Candice, um, the question to you is what innovative finance solutions and policy commitments I needed to support uh, the resilience of, of cl to climate change of protected areas in Africa and to escalate nature-based solutions. I know you mentioned some things, but is there anything you'd care to add to that? And especially on the policy commitments part of it. Absolutely. So I think there is an intersection between policy and what decisions are being made at national and international levels, of course, but there's also the role of the private sector to come in um, and be able to align the way we do business to support those policy interventions. Um, and then importantly, there's the grassroots understanding that needs to come up um, and be able to meet those so that they're actually real and concrete and tangible for people and places um, on the ground. And I think when we look at things like new green deals and stimulus packages coming post-COVID, when we're looking at the big announcements that have happened at COP26 around green finance deals, we have to then be asking ourselves very critical questions around what are our policy frameworks nationally and regionally that are going to be able to support that and ensure that that finance is placed in the right place to scale up nature-based solutions um, and to really address um, what Anthony mentioned in that adaptation gap. Um, in, in looking at that, it just there is economic sense in being able to protect and manage what we have. 
um, as opposed to kind of dealing with the fallout of degradation and loss afterwards. Um, and the role of, of innovative finance in being able to plug that gap is critically important. I really don't believe that there is a one size fits all. I'd love it if there was a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, but there simply isn't. And so we need to have integrated tool sets that begin to answer these. An intersection of climate finance, biodiversity finance, um, different instruments from capital markets to fiscal instruments and others that can be pulled together and we can reach into that tool set and begin to apply it to those different landscapes. And the role of policy frameworks, particularly things like green taxonomies and others, are going to make that either easier or harder. Thanks, Alice. Thanks, Candace. No, very good. I mean, I see you talking about blended finance, you know, the tool going into the toolbox and blending different types of it. And you talked about policy coherence in the policy commitments. But an, another thing you talked about, the grassroots understanding, which I think I want to send to Matteo. Matteo, the question is, what is needed to scale up this access to capital markets in Africa, and especially the grassroots understanding? Because how how is someone, how would do our policymakers who are not necessarily finance specialists, uh, how can they use this? How can we help them access this? How can we, how can we increase that understanding? Over to you. Well, first of all, there needs to be a lot of blended finance, as Candice mentioned. Uh, there's Historically, uh, adaptation and resilience has not been uh, favoured by capital markets because the link between returns of investments and uh, protection of, of nature has been historically not very well understood by investors. Um, and so it is the role of finance institutions and development finance institutions to lure in investors and provide um, instruments that can actually um, allow them to crowd in investors, both at international and domestic level, uh, specifically for Africa at the domestic level, uh, given that there's a large uh, amount of domestic capital and pension fund capital that's completely untapped. Um, in, 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 in countries in Africa. Um, also, we need to put people at the heart of all of this. I mean, I think that we all welcome the commitment of several governments around the world, the UK, US, Dutch, and Norwegian governments to uh, basically create a fund. I think it was $1.7 billion for indigenous people and local communities, because we know that essentially land and forests where local communities and indigenous people live and operate and work are actually protected better um, than, um, than other parts of, 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 of the landscape, really, of the ecosystem. And so we need to provide uh, job opportunities, green job opportunities. We need to provide um, opportunities for growth and job creations within these communities and really sort of make sure that they benefit from capital markets and therefore create a link between grassroots communities and capital markets. There have been uh, a couple of examples around the world of this, specifically in South America, where um, it, it, basically local communities and smallholder farmers have benefited from uh, an intermediary, uh, which is a bank, uh, that has grouped them together. And basically the bank has then tapped capital markets. And uh, so it issued a bond um, for basically adaptation and resilience and specifically for agriculture. So the proceeds of the bond were devoted to regenerative agriculture and through the sales of products and produce generated by the forest and by the, the land, uh, by the crops, basically, the bond was repaid. And so it is possible. Um, we need to basically uh, understand that adaptation and resilience and adaptation specifically financing is still it's in its infancy. Um, and so there are a couple of things that policymakers can do, provide tax incentives, provide the enabling environment for that specific um, investment. You also need local people to uh, basically be at the heart of it. And you need domestic and international investors uh, that can all work together in order to create a system that allows uh, adaptation financing to, to be sustainable, to be long-term. Um, so I think that basically what we need is also to create an awareness in the market. As Anthony was mentioning, that adaptation is in fact something that can provide returns. Over to you, Alice.
Thank you. No, thank you so much, Mateo. I definitely, I got all the, you did the tax incentives and the enabling environment being important. Um, Tony, the audience wants to know what commitments Africa should make to secure transformative solutions and adaptation benefits. I know you've already highlighted four bold actions. And then I think one member also wants to know something about the you, the link to this winning, uh, your, the, your winners that you're going to announce, the link to that event and whether you would be willing to share it. Okay, thank you so much, Alice. It's, um, I have a view that has not been very popular, but it's coming back now. People are beginning to see, excuse me. So people are now beginning to see where I'm coming from. Climate change is a threat to Africa's development. Several years ago, 2015 precisely, we had the El Nino in East Africa. Prior to that time, Ethiopia was self-sufficient in food, growing in di double digits. 2015, we had an El Nino. 2016, the drought came. 2017, there was hunger. 2018, there was famine. And we all said, say no to famine. We carried placards all over the place. No single American child skipped school because the Ethiopian child could not. No single British business collapsed or shut down in solidarity with the Ethiopian woman that lost her livelihood. Ethiopia was left on its own. And I'm simply saying we need to recognize that that when the chips are down, it becomes our development. We need to, first of all, put our foot forward. I'll give you an instance. Africa has a lot of money on around. The commercial banks sit on money, the pension funds, the sovereign wealth funds, you know, name them, all these facilities have it. What stops us from getting them to put resources where we now know that there are investment returns. Infrastructure, for every $1 you invest, you generate about $4 in return. In water, about $12 in return, one to 12. In uh, digital solutions, up to about one to 24. This is what it is. So that's what the tr state and trends has done to let people know that this is what is out there. You know, let's not live in the past. Secondly, a lot of African countries are spending a lot of resources on climate-related investment and are not taking the credit for it. So when they go to conventions like COP, they go with an empty hand thinking, and everybody looks at you, you're coming on the table, you're coming to beg. We're not begging. And that's a message that should come out there. Africa is coming with something on the table. The Congo Basin Forest provides services to the entire world. Imagine if there was no Congo Basin Forest. Imagine if we cut all that and, if, and somebody would tell us that we are coming to the table empty-handed. We are looking at the NDCs. African countries, President Uhuru Kenyatta, last, weekend, last week I was in Nairobi launching the state and trends. He said his government is committing to investing $8 billion over 10 years, and they'll do it for the NDCs, which means $800 million a year. If we did that in our national budget, we would be able to tell the whole world, I, Kenya, we're investing 800 million on climate services. What are you putting on the table? We can go to the Green Climate Fund and say, look, we're not asking you for peanuts. We're not here to beg. We are putting in 600 million on our agriculture program. How much can you put in there? But we don't take advantage of these resources. So my message is let's go back, look inward, and we'll realize that we have more than enough on the table, even though we are victims of climate change. We've left that aside, Africans are investing. But one other, one last thing is that in this investment, most of it comes as loans. And so we are taking money, we are borrowing money for climate actions that we did not cause, and it's contributing to Africa's debt overhang. And we're saying, let's look for ways in managing this. And that's why we're pushing for the debt for climate swap. We owe you 5 billion. How can you convert that 5 billion to climate finance so that we can use that money and deal with our issues 
on the African continent. That's a lot sounder than paying interest every year for a problem we did not cause. For the event on Tuesday, I don't have the schedule here with me, but uh, I'll try to send it back to Chris and the rest on the event okay. for this. But importantly, beyond these particular events, let's link up with the Global Center on Adaptation because other competitions are coming up. Yeah, other competitions okay. are coming okay. up and then we'll be able to uh, gain more. Thank you. Thank you. No, we'll definitely link up to get that uh, that for our participants. I know we have 10 minutes left and before I invite uh, Manuel to come and give us the closing remarks, I just, uh, I just had one question from uh, for all of you from the um, audience, which I will give you and maybe one word each. But uh, Tony, I also I actually wanted to support you by saying that maybe we should do a date for climate swap for the 1.2 billion tons of carbon at the carbon sink that uh, the Congo Basin contributes <laughs> contributes every year, as you said. And I was reading that 94 banks in Africa contribute $24 billion. So really, you're right. We have we have the money and we should be organize ourselves uh, much better. All right. So the last question from our audience is, as we head into COP27, which is going to be in Africa, and the African Trade Areas Congress we mentioned earlier uh, in March, what is that one thing, one thing, I'll ask all of you to tell me the one thing that you want us to really focus on. Kevin, one thing? Sure, that's, uh, <laughs> that's difficult to, to put. Um... One line. Yes, I think I think what would be great is to hear uh, is to hear Africa's voice at the uh, at, at both events. So really hear what what can be done from African solutions for for global problems. I think that's that would be fascinating. Fantastic, fantastic. African voice, African solutions for global problems. Candice. So, like Kevin, I feel like that's a, a bit of a unicorn to chase after is to to name just one thing. Uh, but I think for me, it's it's the pioneering spirit that you see across the continent, um, that regardless of challenges to grab hold of opportunities, push boundaries, uh, and really problem solve. So um, I'd, I'd love to see that pioneering spirit really showcased. Um, and for me, that really bridges gaps between sectors, between people, between places. Pioneering spirit, good. People, places. Yes, I like that. Matteo? I think I would like to see more commitments from governments around the world uh, to actually provide um, uh, guarantees of funds for us to be able to experiment and provide those innovative solutions uh, that can basically trigger the flows of capital um, into, into Africa for adaptation and allow basically domestic capital markets to flourish as opposed to international capital markets, really. Great, Harisoa. Domestic markets finance guarantees. Got that. Harisoa. You are muted. Sorry. In fact, I'm driving this climate change for our packs. I think that uh, I want really to hear from Mojas, but I think that something that we need to push forward as well is a locally led solution. How we can really put the communities up front, driving solution and using nature. So maybe something right. for us, Africa. Yeah, thank you. Good. Tony, I know you already said your piece. No, so, no, no. Uh, like, I have, I have my piece to say. One word. One word. <laughs> one word. Okay. I think it right. is very, it's very unfair for anybody to want to hear Africa's voice. We've spoken. We've shouted. We've screamed. Our voices have gone hoarse. I don't know what voice we want to hear again. Let people act. The Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program is coming up has come up with a $25 billion program. And the African Development Bank says, out of our commitment, we're putting in 12.5 billion. Let the rest of the world put in 12.5 billion. Out of the 100 billion promised. I think this is the time now for action. We've talked for too long. We've, we've mm -hmm. presented solutions. We've presented strategies. Enough of all that we want to see actionable actions in favor of Africa. Thank you. Time for action. Thank you. Time for action. Manuel, yes. mm -hmm. you have the last word, the last time yours to, to, to summarize this and, and uh, give us some parting words. Uh, 
it's my pleasure to invite my colleague Manuel, who is the head of our climate and energy program at WWF. Manuel, welcome. Thank you, Alison. I hope that you can listen to me well. As you can see, I am walking because it, it, we are in rush time here in COP27, 26, sorry. Uh, I am now thinking in the 27, but let's start by trying to organize my ideas on what I have heard in four fronts. The first one, it is more related to pending topics. The second one, it is about the political and financial trends. Really, the third one, it will be more about finance. And the fourth one, about new opportunities that are emerging. Let's start by saying when I think about how can we connect nature with climate, uh, what are still pending, pending tasks? The first one it is, in my point of view, the lack of number of countries that have prepared their adaptation plans. That is really sad. We know how vulnerable we are. We know how vulnerable Africa it is. And the total number of 200 countries of the world that have already prepared adaptation plans, it is 34. No more than that. And, and for sure, there are like many, many African countries that have never developed or put on the table an adaptation plan. And that is for me a pending task. My second element that it is more pending, it could be seen as an opportunity. I heard in the first intervention, the role of protected areas. Friends, we have years of years of good experience and good lessons from protected areas management. And I see that we have to bring more closer those lessons and that expertise into the climate debate and to see how much conservation can continue contributing to address our climate crisis. So, so those are for me two pending topics. Now let's move I me mean, into the political trends. What it is amazing, it is how much the connection in between climate and nature, it is getting traction. As you probably know, yesterday here in COP26, we heard good announcement in relation to forest and land use that were related not only to this new declaration, but also to some new funds, some new money, and that also include money to protect or to promote land tenure of indigenous people. So, so there is a clear new trend that we hope that it could be strengthened through the CBD COP15 in Kunming, and even more in the summit that will celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Stockholm summit in June of next year in Stockholm, Sweden. So, so the point is that the political traction is there and we should take advantage of that. That moved me to find, and it is true that the lack of money to cover adaptation and to cover the relation in between climate and nature, it is huge. And then we should cover that gap. For sure, we have heard of some good news, some countries that are putting some percentage of their office, uh, official assistance for development into those kind of links, into, into those new opportunities to bring nations more close to climate. But we know that that is not enough. Also, we are still working the replenishment of the EF, no? and that is a key element that the new president of the EF, it is working in trying to have a replenishment that at least could mean 150% more on what used to be. So move from 4 billion to 6 billion, and, and that is something important that I think we should continue pushing for. But when we think about finance for nature, it is not just about those very traditional mechanisms or new funds from the, mostly from developed world. Also, we are talking on the importance of sorting soon the difficulty and, and contentious relation in between climate and nature when we think about the net zero. Because still there are some doubts on nation-based solution and what it should be the role of nation-based solutions to get the net zero. Still, there are some resistance to the voluntary carbon market. Still, there are many doubts in relation to BEX and CDR. So the point is, how are we planning to address those contentious topics? Because the best way to address a good reconciliation in between climate and nature, it is by sorting all those elements. And let me finish with the opportunities. And I have already mentioned one of those, nation-based solutions. It is emerging as a key element of the debate. Uh, even more important when we know that in many of the global south, the main source of emission it is related to deforestation, land use. So, so it, it is related to sources that are focused or, or, are, or, or are related, sorry for the redundance, to nation. So the point it is how much nation-based solution could be useful to have countries addressing their targets from their own NDCs, but more than that, also how it could be used to promote 
uh, good practices based in traditional knowledge, in, in traditional infrastructure, no, that could be developed by the communities on the ground. So that is a key element, and we should continue working in strengthening nation-based solutions as a key opportunity for the global south. And let me finish by saying that I Thank think you. that the debt, debt swap for climate, it could be also a good mechanism. Remember, friends, that okay. this wouldn't be the first experience. We used to have this more than 20 years ago and worked well. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, Manuel, and thank you, everyone. We are out of time, but what a fantastic discussion, you know, nature-based solutions, pioneering spirit, time for action, finance, gosh, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of excellent opportunities here as we head into COP27 and into APAC. We look forward to seeing you, all of you there. Thank you again to you and all the participants and all the moderators. Thanks, Manuel, as well. All right, goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Yeah, thanks, Alice, thank and bye-bye. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much.